Ah, screens. Is it good being church? Yes. Hey, why don't you thank your worship team? Good looking you are. Even through the mask, you're good looking. Uh, very good. Well, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Steve, and um, I've been a friend of Ashley and Alison for many years, and they've been very good friends to my wife, Sue, and I, um, and our family. Love their family, love their generosity, love their heart for kingdom, and um, just love having them come to Adelaide when they can and uh, spend time with us, sitting down having coffee and cheese and all the other things that go with that. Uh, so, so good. But pleasure to be here this morning just to share the word with you. I might share a little bit more about our story tonight. Um, but just really have a message on my heart that I believe God's given me for the church, which I don't, I don't, I say that with honestly, with uh, humility. Um, but I do believe it's for a word in season for the church, and I want to encourage you around that this morning. But let me ask you a question. Who grew up in a card-playing family? A card play. I mean, all of you old panties will think, oh, no, you didn't do that because that's just ungodly. You had to go to, you know, Jesus comes back while you're playing cards. He's not going to go to heaven, right? It's just not on. Well, I grew up in a, you know, a closet play, closet uh, card playing family. We used to love playing euchre, right? or the modern version of that is 500. And you have your bowers of the, now for some of you got no idea what to do, you can look it up on YouTube later, find out what it is. But there was, if you were playing euchre, there's usually four people, you and your partner opposite, and the, the teams are, you're playing against two other people. And you go around and you look at your cards and you make what is going to be called the trump card. The, the, the suit that's going to be the trumps for that, for that round. And it's wonderful when the other team makes the suit and you're sitting with the trump cards in your hand. Who knows, who knows that feeling? You, you go, you idiot, you're stupid. You must have, I don't know what you're, whether this is all bluff, but you're not going to make this because I'm sitting with the trump cards, right? And you hold the trump cards back. Right, you let them think they're going to win, and you get to go first round. They, well, that's yeah, okay. Oh boy, you, you just look, that poker face or the euchre face, and you and you you play it, and you get to you got two two rounds each. There's five cards in the game, and you're sitting with the the bow or the right bower in your hand, which is usually the the jack of that of that uh, hand that was made, the suit that was made, and you sit there and you let them all play all their three cards, and then at the last you just go. Gotcha, you car, right? And you and you win, right? And to be honest, I feel this morning we're in a season where it feels like the enemy is trying playing some games, and he's playing his cards, and he thinks he's winning certain things, but we're sitting with the trump card in our hand. The church is sitting, and the church is the trump card that God wants to play, and. We may be sitting here going, well, we're not quite sure what's happening because I know when someone makes the suit, you're going, uh, I've got two trump cards in my hand. I don't know what they're doing, um, but we'll just see. And there's a little bit of hesitancy to think they might have a handful, but you just know you're sitting with, with the answer that it's going to win. So this morning, I want, to, I want to talk about this simple statement. And if you walk away remembering this only, then I've done my job this morning, is mission trumps moments. Mission trumps moments. Everyone say that. Mission. What is it? And we are in a moment right now. We're in a moment of time that we have never experienced before, right? History has proven that this has happened before. For those of you who have studied a little bit of history, my, my background, by the way, is I'm a high school music teacher. I don't pre profess to be a historian. And um, for those who know me a little bit more, understand that it was a good thing that I got out of teaching because God didn't rescue me from it. He rescued the children from me. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not a history teacher. So I had to look this up, okay, on our friend, Mr. Google. 1300s. Black Death, bubonic, 
bubonic plague, between 25 and 50 million people died. Right? It was responsible for the death of one third of the world population. It was so bad that England and France, they were incapable of facilitating their war. So they had to call a truce <laughs> when that happened. Late, 90, late 1400s, early 1500s, smallpox and measles broke out right throughout Europe after Christopher Columbus explored the Caribbean. He brought it back with him. The Aztec Empire didn't fall to the Spanish invasion. They actually fell to smallpox and they couldn't continue the fight. 1600s, bubonic plague broke out again. It broke out in London, and we know it as the Great Plague of London. It only started to taper off when the Great Fire of London took on. <laughs> 1720, right? You notice it's this sort of every 100 years. 1720, the bubonic plague. Sorry, 1720, the Great Plague of Marseille. A million people in France lost their life. 1820, the first cholera pandemic broke out in Kolkata, India and spread through Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa and the Mediterranean. 100 years ago, 1920s, was the Spanish flu. Known as the most deadliest influenza pandemic humanity has ever witnessed, 500 million people fell victim to the Spanish flu. Many indigenous communities were pushed back to the brink of extinction. 50 million people lost their life in the Spanish flu 100 years ago. 2020, we have coronavirus. Just listen to the different statistics. 50 million 100 years ago, we've only lost 4.5 million with coronavirus. I don't say that tritely. But I want to show you something that this is not anything new. We are in a moment in time. And I want to tell you some good news. In all of this time, the gospel has survived. The message of Jesus has thrived. It's con the churches continue to grow. And it's not bound to a moment because mission trumps. Mission trumps moments. In Jesus' day, it was leprosy. It's going to be there. We, the church, just need to know how to deal with it. And so this morning, no doubt, you've had lots of conversations with your friends. There's lots of controversy in every area of our world right now. Leaders have different opinions of what they should do or what they shouldn't do. We have different opinions of what the leaders should do and shouldn't do, right? There's the anti-vaxxers and the pro-vaxxers. There's the freedom rallies. There's the conspiracy theorists, there's the end time people. I've got people in my church that won't come to church because I've got to wear masks and think we're giving into some Marxist theory. I've got one letter like that. I've got another letter saying, why are we singing in church? We should be wearing our masks and people are singing. They shouldn't be singing. We're disobeying the government. And we're teaching the young people bad things. <laughs> and I'm sitting there as a pastor going, I can't please everybody. What am I to do? Well, I'll tell you, mission Trump's moments. The truth is, coronavirus will pass. This time will pass, but the message of Jesus will continue to grow. The church of God will continue to flourish. Ah, funny moments, eh? The truth is, if we allow ourselves to sink to the moment, and this moment has the ability to derail our thoughts, as to derail, derail our processes, our drive, cloud our vision, and the mission that's got before us becomes subservient to the moment we're in. So I want to show you from Scripture how the mission continues to thrive in a, in a situation that we've heard many, many times preached from the pulpit about Paul and Silas in jail. Now, I was a, a musician, I oh, still am a musician, once a musician, always a musician, right? Um, I was a worship pastor and I teach on praise, teach on worship, I love it. I think it's a powerful thing that God uses in the church. And I wanted to teach on praise and worship to our, to our not to our worship team, to our church. Wanted to lift the value of in the church. And so 
I went to Paul and Silas to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They prayed to watch him in jail and there was an earthquake and all things happened to us. Oh, it's awesome, right? And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, can you please read this in context? <laughs> but God, you know, <laughs> I've read this a hundred times, right? Can you please read it in context? So I went back to the beginning of Acts ch chapter 15 and Acts chapter 16 and read how this fitted into the context of what was happening in Paul and Silas's life at the time. And my, my eyes were opened. And this morning, hopefully, I can open your eyes to see a little bit beyond the moment and see that we are called to a mission that always trumps the moments we're in. So Paul and Silas, Acts chapter 16, they have been authorised to go on their second missionary journey. Paul decides to take Silas with him. He's authorised by the Jerusalem Council, who was the Apostle Peter and the Apostle James. They authorised them to go and strengthen the churches that they went and established on their first missionary journey. On the way, Paul meets Timothy, and some theologians would say that Timothy joined them on their journey as they continued on their second missionary journey. So we're picking this up. Let's read in Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 15. I think it's going to come up on the screen. Next, Paul and Silas travelled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. I want you to, I want you to note that the Holy Spirit, what? Prevented them. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again... Again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. We call that the Macedonian call. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once. Note this, having concluded that God was calling us to what? To preach the good news there. We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across the island of Semithras. And the next day we landed in Neapolis. From there we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Very important, a Roman colony. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be pray meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some of the women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth. So whoever's in purple, doing well, um, who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptised and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I'm a true believer, she, see, she was a salesman, she knew how to spin it, right? right? If you believe I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. How can they not go, right? And she urged us until we agreed. Now that is some woman who knows what she's doing. Right? She just gets saved and said, you'll come to my house and I'm not taking no for an answer, right? So I just want to show you a little bit about the trip. I do apologise for the, you know, how this map looks. It's not real great. Okay, so they take off around this place here is where they meet Timothy and then they travel all the way through Asia right up to Troas where they got on a boat and go over to Neapolis and to Philippi. This is the interesting thing. This red part where they travelled was where the Holy Spirit said, don't talk about Jesus. Have a look how big it is. It's about three to 400 kilometres. So what were they commissioned to do? They were commissioned to take the gospel. And in taking the gospel for three to 400 kilometres, they were not allowed to talk about Jesus at all. And they didn't have cars, by the way. So that is a walking journey of three to four. I don't know how long it take you to walk that, but that's a long way for me. So for weeks, they weren't allowed, told by the Holy Spirit, prevented by the Holy Spirit to talk about Jesus. So here's a few points for you. Number one, when you are on mission, expect the Holy Spirit to lead you. 
when you are on mission, expect the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Okay? The Holy Spirit is known as our guide. When you're walking in your grace and in your mission, God will speak. He will speak to you. He's known as our guide. He's known as our comforter. He's our protector. Now, we love Him as our comforter. We love the Holy Spirit as our comforter. The guide, however, sometimes is not what we always see Jesus or see the Holy Spirit doing. And notice the Holy a guide is, some, is a person that takes you on a journey and directs you to your outcome, but the guide does this. They say, watch that step there. Don't go there. Be careful. There's a, there's a, a tree root coming up. Make sure you step over that probably because I don't want you to trip. Right? A guide goes ahead and clearly marks and defines the boundaries by which we walk. So what did the Holy Spirit do to them? He said, I don't want you to go here, one boundary. So they start to go the other way. He says, whoa, 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 no, I don't want you to go there either. I want you to stay within the boundaries of what I've called you to do. I want you to stay on mission. The Holy Spirit spoke to Paul through a dream, Right? So if he can't get you through your ear, he'll get through to you through a dream. He also pervade, he forbade him to share the good news in Asia. And some theologians would say he, God did that, the Holy Spirit did that because you know, they weren't open to hear it and they could lose their life. And, and we don't really know why the Holy Spirit did that. And we, don't, we can only speculate, but there was a reason the Holy Spirit told them. Maybe it wasn't their time to speak there, but as I was reading this, I just said, why, why would you say that? So these are a few thoughts. You know, there are some places and there are some subjects and there are some issues that although we may feel we need to go there and we may feel like we've got the answer, the Holy Spirit just might say, it's not for you. Don't go there. Don't have that conversation. Some say that Paul and Silas could have lost their lives. But perhaps sometimes, and I say this, especially in this moment, we find ourselves in conversations and we find ourselves feeling like we're going to speak on behalf of the Holy Spirit or we feel like we've got the answer. But if you incline your ear, I think in this time, there's a time for us to not say anything because we get caught, get caught up in conversations that we're not authorised to speak on. And all we do as a church is we start speaking and sounding like everybody else and we're not set apart like everybody else and we're getting into conversations and arguments and theories of other people instead of just realising that's the Holy Spirit's job and I'm called to do what I'm called to do. Our motive might be good. Our motive might be pure. We, ain't, we might even feel like I'm doing God's job here. But if we listen, he just might say, not you, not your time, just be quiet. Have you been like me? You found yourself sitting watching the news and getting up out of your seat and yelling at the TV? <laughs> Mate. Lucky nothing is close because I would have had a wrecked TV. I just get so angry at the lunacy. I need to stop there. And I get riled up. I actually told my, my, my campus the other day, I said, I'm going to go into politics. Seriously, they need some leadership. The Holy Spirit just said, Really? But when I read this, I had to repent and say, God, not my place. Not my place. And listen to this scripture. This will help you. Even the Holy Spirit knows when to speak and when not to speak. John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Underline this part in your Bible. For he will not speak. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So if the Holy Spirit who knows everything, the Holy Spirit who's the Spirit of God knows everything, he's submitted to the will of the Father and there's times where he will not speak. Even though he's all-knowing. 
And we've got limited knowing, but we blap our jaw off all the time. There's a time to speak and a time not to speak. When you are on mission, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. He will guide you. But understand, sometimes the guide is a, don't go there, don't go there, Uh uh-uh, not for you, come around here. 400 kilometers I had to walk and not share the gospel. Pretty amazing, right? Number two, this sounds like I'm actually speaking the opposite, but you are authorized and you are empowered. Paul and Silas were authorized by the apostles in Jerusalem and they were sent. Jesus has sent you. Very simple. But let me say, Jesus has sent you. You are commissioned to complete his mission. The spirit of Jesus lives within you. John 17, 18. Just as you sent me into the world, this is Jesus speaking, I am sending them into the world. John 6, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me. Here it is, not to do my own will. You're commissioned. Here's a little thought for you. So everything that we look for in God to make our life nicer, maybe just not to make our life nicer. We want to overcome fear. We heard this morning. Anxiety, frustration. We want to overcome that. We want the power. We want to put on the armor of God. We want to have the garment of praise. We want the Holy Spirit baptism. But as I look in my Bible, none of that's really for me. None of that's really to make my life better and easier. What it's actually for is for the commissioning of the mission to empower me to complete the mission. But we want all the good things so we can make our life nicer because we interpret Romans 8.28 as for all things work together for good. But the problem is we think it's our version of good instead of his version of good. Some of you may know or may not know this. Three months ago, I lost my wife. I've been married for 36 years. Lost her to cancer. It was a horrific journey. But I've got to allow the word to overcome my emotion and overcome my pain to understand that if all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purposes, God has a plan bigger than my moment. I don't know why. I don't know why God didn't heal her. I don't don't know why God decided to take, she's a flippin' amazing singer, by the way, why he he took her to be in heaven. I don't know why he did that. We prayed, we had communion every night of the week for 18 months. But God still decided to take her. But is it for my good? I've got to believe that he's got an agenda way beyond my, my moment. Anyway, so maybe our gift is not for us, but to draw and point people to Jesus. Maybe the mission of Jesus does not bow down to moments and hysteria and pandemic. Maybe the mission of Jesus and the proof of it historically has been the mission of Jesus has continued to grow. So point number three, salvation's are always fruit of being on mission. Salvations are always fruit of being on mission. Jesus came to seek and save those who were lost. Lydia was proof of this. When they went over to Philippi, they went to look for, go and pray with people and then they led Lydia to the Lord. Luke 4, 18 and 19. Do you want to know what the mission is? This is it. This is your mission. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. My goodness, right now, that's a big deal. Mental health is a massive deal, but he's actually given me the authority and commissioned me to go and tell them that the oppressed can be released. 
from their oppression and to declare that the time of the Lord's favour has come. This is the mission. This is what the Holy Spirit has commissioned you to do to complete this mission. You know, you're to be a bringer of good news. Proclaim that the captives are released. Believe the blind will see. My last point. Goes for a long time, this one. <laughs> On mission, you will have moments. But those moments can look like a prison or an opportunity. It's up to you. So let's pick this story up. They're over in Philippi. They go to pray again, probably down by the river to meet some believers and maybe lead more people to Jesus. On the way down, there's been this little girl following after them, declaring out to everybody, behold, servants of the Most High God, they have come to tell you you have, you have to be saved. They actually were telling the truth. This little girl was telling the truth. But Paul got ticked. He got upset and he turned around to her and he cast the demon out of her and she was set free. So not only do people get saved, but signs and wonders will follow. Did he do anything wrong? No, he, he saw that little girl free. But that little girl belonged to some business people who were using her to tell fortunes of other people and they got really upset because they just saw their business fail immediately before their eyes. So they got upset and went to the leaders of the town and it says in, in the Word of God that Paul and Silas were severely beaten. Not just beaten, they were severely beaten with rods. Modern day cricket bats, right? And then they found themselves in the inner dungeon of the jail chained up by their legs. For those of you who've been around a long time, remember Keith Green? He said they were the first bankers in, in the Bible. They were in stocks and bonds. <laughs> boom, boom. I love dad jokes. I'm a grandfather. It's just, I've got an excuse to do it now. So the owners reacted. They were in jail. They were in the middle of the jail. It was dark. They were chained by their legs and they were in seven day lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what their conversation was about. However, one thing I do know is the situation never stopped them from pressing on with their mission. Yeah. I don't know what you would have said if you were Silas. I know what I would have said. Seriously? You had to show off. <laughs> Why? For six days, you never did anything. You just let her go on. Why couldn't you continue? Just let her go on, right? Why did you have to turn around and just show off and get, look what's happened, man. We're in jail. It's because you just couldn't keep your mouth closed. The Holy Spirit said keep your mouth closed last week, but this week you can't. What is wrong with you? You didn't even ask me. We're supposed to be a team. What are you doing? That's what I would have said. Let's just think about this. Maybe I'm being too logical. A week or so before, they were walking across what is known as Turkey now. 400 kilometers of walking. No talking about Jesus. No preaching. No signs and wonders. They were walking. They get over to Philippi and they're released by the Holy Spirit. Lead Lydia to Jesus, casting out demons. Walking through Turkey, they freely walked, not saying anything. Over here, they're released by the Holy Spirit and they find themselves in jail. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, right? But I think Paul understood that if he was commissioned on a journey, on a mission, then the Holy Spirit was going before it. I think he just would have thought, you know what? The Holy Spirit's up to something. I don't know what, it's, what it is, but I'm sure he's got a plan. So let's just go with the plan and realize that he's going to speak when he needs to speak. 
They knew their mission. But their mission landed them in jail. So let's pick it up. They were in the darkest place in the jail. They were in the inner dungeon. It was dark, dingy, and rank. It would have stunk, right? They didn't have toilets in their jails. Just so you know, the floors, the jail was in layers. They were in the middle, and, you know, the toilet would have went down. Sorry. Just giving you a picture. So here they are. They didn't preach. They didn't have a debate about the law as to whether what happened to them was just or unjust. Paul didn't give his personal testimony. He didn't say, hey, by the way, do you know I met Jesus on the road and I got blinded for three days and I got healed. He didn't say anything. He didn't have a theological rant about, hey, you Gentiles, you're okay, you can get saved. You don't have to get circumcised, but us Jews, we had to get circumcised. You're actually free from this. He didn't talk about anything. All he did was praise. All he did was worship. All he did was bring God into the circumstance. All he did was bring God into the situation. Funny thing about this. right? Stay with me because this is quite interesting. Paul didn't even tell them that he was a Roman citizen until after everything had happened and they wanted to release him from jail. He says, no, I'm not going out of this place. You read it. The earthquake came, everything happens, and they realise Paul's a Roman citizen and they go, oh, no, we're in trouble because this is a Roman, Roman colony. We've just beaten a Roman citizen up and we need to get him out of our city because we're in trouble. And so they come and say, hey, hey, Paul, you can go, you can go. And he said, no, nah, I'm not going. You need to apologise because I'm a Roman citizen. This is my thought. I, if it was me being belted up with rods, I would have said, excuse me, I'm a Roman citizen. You shouldn't be doing this to me. There's no way you should be beating me up because you're going to get in trouble because I'm a Roman citizen. But he said nothing. Why didn't he say that? And to be honest, I might ask you when I get to heaven. But I believe he had a bigger picture to realise that the Holy Spirit was up to something because the Holy Spirit released him to preach and teach and, and signs and wonders followed. He released him to do this and it landed him in the prison so just maybe God had a plan in the prison that he didn't know what that plan was we read on there and we realize the plan was for the jailer because when you're on mission there's always salvation Acts chapter 17, 27, let me quickly read. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors were wide. He assumed the prisoners had escaped and he drew a sword to kill himself. And Paul shouted, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights to turn on. And there's a great prophetic statement. Because there are a lot of lights that need to go on for a lot of people. He called for the lights and he ran to the dungeon and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> it says there in verse 25 the other prisoners were listening they were listening to them singing they were listening to worshipping listening to him praising it's not something that they would have been used to they would have been used to grown men crying they would have been used to grotesque scenes they would have been used to people trying to justify their circumstances I shouldn't be in here it's unjust there would have been all sorts of things they heard but they heard the sweetness of someone's heart worshipping God and they could hear them and they were quiet I wonder what song they were singing I wonder what they were singing because you notice when the jailer come he didn't have to be told anything about Jesus he just said what must I do to be saved I wonder what they were singing in their or what they were preaching in their singing. It says that they were in darkness and they were listening in darkness. Here's my question to you. 
who's listening to your song in the darkness of your life that you don't know is watching? Who's listening to what comes out of your heart, out of your mouth in this moment where we're in lockup, this moment where we don't understand what's happening, this moment that we don't know what's happening? Who is listening to your song? Who's listening to your song? They weren't angry. They just worshipped. All they did was praise. All they did was worship. They could have lost the plot. Because if I was Silas, I would have lost the plot. And I would have succumbed to the moment and derailed my mission I want to tell you church no other time in our lifetime has there ever been a moment where we need to stay on mission no other time in our lifetime has there ever been a moment where we the song of our life need to sing something that is completely different to everybody else's song there's no other time in history in our lifetime where what we say will be so contrary what we sing will be so contrary to every other conversation that they're used to and our song will rise above and what will happen in the darkness they'll start listening In the darkness, they'll start listening. This is what Paul said. I'm going to say it to you. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour, the earthquake was at midnight. Even at that hour, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. Psalm 23. His rod and his staff will come for me. He'll set a table before me in the presence of my... The jailer was his enemy. He was holding him captive, but all of a sudden now the jailer becomes his servant. And his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. My encouragement to you, let's not focus on the moment. Let's keep our eyes focused on the mission. Let our song be a song of worship. Let our song be a song of praise. Let people hear our song of our life be such that they can't help. They hear the gospel in our life and they come to you and say, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? Because what you're seeing, what you're living, how you're living your life out is so different to everybody else. I'm attracted to this, even though, even though you're in the prison, you're in the prison with me. But you've got a different song. You've got a different song. Jesus said this way, the fields are white for harvest, but the workers are few. My extrapolation of that, maybe the workers have got caught up in the moment and lost sight of the mission. Amen. Ask you a question, do you know Jesus this morning? Do you know Him? Or do, are you here this morning because there's people that you've been looking at and they're singing a song that you're attracted to? That song can only be sung when you've come to know who Jesus is in your life. That you can be anxiety free, anger free and content even though you've been beaten, even though you're in prison, it's not holding you because the mission of the kingdom far surpasses your imprisonment. And maybe you're here this morning because you've seen that or the Holy Spirit's been attracting you to this church or something's happening in you that you are longing for that light. You've been longing for that song. You've been longing to see what this life's all about. Let me tell you, it's only found in Jesus and Him alone. Doesn't mean you're not going to get in prison, but boy, I bet your song will be different when you're in the middle of it. So I'll ask you this question, do you know Jesus? If you don't, I would love to introduce Him to you. 
and come join mission with us and see the world transformed. The Bible says to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. The confession is, I put my trust in you, Jesus. I take my leave from you. I believe you are the Son of God, that you died and you rose again. And I choose this day to turn from me leading my life to following you. It's that simple. Your moment will become your mission. So I'm just asking all eyes, to, all eyes to, to be closed and heads to be bowed. If that's you this morning, I'm just going to ask you. I'm going to count to three and just ask you to lift your hands. And we want to pray for you. I want to introduce you to some friends here that will take you on a journey of discovering Jesus more in your life. For some of you, you could be racing on the inside. Man, what's happening to me? Why am I responding this way? That's the Holy Spirit drawing you. So the count of three, if that's you this morning, just quickly lift your head and lift your hand. I'll recognize you and then we'll pray. So the count of three, one, two, three. Is anyone here this morning? You just want to know who Jesus is? Anyone? Thank you. you see your hand, you can put that down. Anyone else this morning? You might feel like you're one of the prisoners watching on. You've been looking at this, but you're drawn to something this morning. You're drawn to who Jesus is. Is there anyone else? Just quickly raise your hand before I hand back. Anyone else? Okay, can we just all say this prayer together? Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for rising again. And thank you for giving me life, your life. And this morning I give back my life and I ask you to come into my world. Be my comforter, be my guide, be my saviour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.